Hey everybody, welcome to our panel today. On behalf of the BYU Mesa Alumni Society, I would love to welcome you. I'm so glad that you were able to join us. Um, we have an incredible panel today um, that I'm so excited to learn from. I did want to mention um, that due um, to them volunteering their time um, and this panel being so generous and kind to us, um, what is said today will be off the record, so please no tweeting or personal recordings um, of any kind. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I also just wanted, for those of you who aren't aware of the Alumni Society, we try to, try to plan a couple of events every year to get uh, alumni engaged with students, alumni engaged with alumni, and alumni more engaged with the Middle East. And so this is a part of that mission. And so we're so grateful for the panelists and I'll go ahead and hand it over to Professor Gubler. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I'd also like to welcome you here. We're excited to see um, uh, a number of you. I see this group, Friends in Morocco. I'm interested in who that is. Um, but um, I'm Professor Gubler. Uh, my research is uh, on conflict resolution and particularly with focus on the Arab-Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And so I'm excited for our, uh, our gathering today, really excited to hear from these panelists. Um, I, I thought what I would do is just provide a brief introduction to Ropes and, uh, and to its director, and then we'll let him introduce our panelists. You know, at BYU, we don't uh, formally endorse any particular organization, but we love to learn from and work with a number of them, have our students be, be involved. Um, and Ropes, which was founded in 2017, I think is, uh, is one of those great organizations. It's a young and discreet initiative that works to expand the Coalition for Israeli-Palestinian Peace by connecting forward-thinking Israeli and Palestinian emerging leaders with like-minded allies from across the Arab world. Over the past two years, Ropes has held summits um, for Arab and Israeli emerging leaders in both Paris and Vienna, and has also sponsored an ongoing webinar series featuring high profile figures such as former Israeli Foreign Minister T.P. Livni, former U.S. Ambassador to Israel Dan Shapiro, and both the Emirati and Bahraini ambassadors to the United States. Over the coming months, the organization will be launching new people to people initiatives in the fields of education, media, tourism and climate change. And Ropes was, was recently featured at the annual conference of the US pro-peace lobby, J Street. Um, now its founder, Ben, who I've gotten to know a little bit, um, and I just think is fantastic. He's the founder and, and executive director of Ropes. For starting Ropes, Ben reported on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for the New Republic and other leading publications. He wrote the magazine's 2013 cover story on the two-state solution called Mind Altering by former Secretary of State John Kerry and co-authored his 2014 article on the Kerry Peace Talks, which received the National Press Club's Edwin Hood Award for diplomatic reporting and a National Magazine Award nomination. Ben has been a guest Israel spec expert on BBC, CNN, and MSNBC and earned his undergraduate degrees from Cornell and, a, and an MPA from Princeton's University School for Public and International Affairs. So I'm, I'm excited to welcome him and our panelists here, and I'll turn the time to him for a moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Gubler, and thank you all for coming. I, I wanna thank the entire BYU team for making this event happen. And especially, I wanna thank um, our intern from this past summer, Tristan Quist, without whom this wouldn't be happening. Uh, one thing I want to say to all the students on the line is if you are interested in this issue, 
And if you like the approach that we're bringing to the table, um, please feel free to reach out to us at info at ropes.org because we are always looking for good interns. You know, I guess by way of preface, before I introduce our panelists, what I wanted to say is that, as I'm sure you all know, good news is hard to come by in the Middle East. And I think that's why these past couple of years are so exciting, because for the first time, there is good news in the Middle East, and there's especially good news when it comes to Israel-Palestine. And to me, the most bright uh, piece of news, you know, our, our tagline for ropes is a new generation, a new Middle East. And there really is a new generation throughout the Arab world. Um, and when it comes to the issue of Israel-Palestine, this is a generation that, like previous generations, wants to see justice for the Palestinians. But I think what's novel is that they also want to see peace with Israel, and they don't see those two things as incompatible. In fact, as we do, they see those things as going hand in hand. And ROPES was really created um, to reach out to those people, whether in countries like Morocco, like the UAE and Bahrain, or even like Iraq, where we just had a delegate to our recent conference. And believe it or not, um, despite all of the organizations that are working on amazing people-to-people -people efforts, I believe ROPES is still the only one that is getting Israelis, Palestinians, and regional Arabs in the same room um, together. So we'd love to tell you more about it, and I uh, hope you will take the time to learn more. Um, um, and I think also it's very important that as we expand the Coalition for Peace in the Middle East, it's also, it's also very important to expand it outside the Middle East in places like the US, that it's not just Jews and Arabs working on this issue. And one reason I was very excited to do this event with BYU is that I view the LDS community as a community that really um, could play an important role on this issue, partly because of the strong affinity they have for the Holy Land, um, but also in my experience with the LDS community, it's, it's been uh, really brought home to me that this is a community that values compromise and values moderation. And I think we need more communities that really wanna see something that's good for both Israelis and Palestinians, um, and not simply something that's good for one side and not the other. So with that, I wanna introduce four of the young leaders in the ROPES network. Um, we have many others, including parliament members, business leaders, but these four ladies are really some of our all-stars. So let me start with Naveen. Naveen is a Palestinian activist and ex expert in the fields of program development, management, peace building, and gender issues. She currently serves as ROPES COO, and in, in addition, works with the German Association for Development Cooperation in a grassroots-based initiative called Ju um, Judy From Me to You that connects women and volunteers in several civil society organizations. She is the director of the newly established NGO, Our Rights in Jerusalem, focusing on civil and political rights of Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Bisan Salman, a Palestinian citizen of Israel, serves as ROPES' as director of external relations, overseeing the organization's diplomatic relations in Europe and the Middle East. Prior to joining ROPES, Bisan served as the political advisor to the Japanese embassy in Tel Aviv. Um, and Shama Mehtali, born and raised in Morocco. Shama is the founder and CEO of Moors and Saints. She's an impact entrepreneur, a jewelry designer, a visual artist, an intersectional feminist, an advocate for interfaith dialogue, and a consultant for peace building and sustainability projects. And Shama recently took part in a delegation to Israel of people from the countries that were part of the Abraham Accords, which I'm sure she'll speak about. And last but not least, Ksenia Svetlova, uh, who was born in Moscow, is a former member of Knesset and an expert on Middle Eastern affairs, radical Islam, and modern Egypt. She is currently a senior research fellow at the Institute for Policy and Strategy at the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya and a senior policy fellow at the Meet Beam Institute for Foreign Policy. So with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Gubler. I hope you will ask uh, some great questions of our panel. Please just put your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we will get to them as soon as we can. Thank you so much, Dr. Gubler. Yeah, so we've, we will begin with some questions that were sent by those uh, who signed up on our registration link. Um, but we encourage additional questions and we'll, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, so I'm excited to, uh, to meet with this panel. You know, the first question that I have is, we know that ROPES is an organization that takes a regional focus to support peace, right? And um, in recent years, we've seen developments like the Abraham Accords. We've seen other developments that have changed the relationship between Israel and its Arab neighbors. And the first question that I'll put to all of you um, 
And maybe we'll just start with Bisan since she's at the top of my screen, but then just kind of work around. You can unmute yourselves as you would like. Um, first question I have is what do you think these changes mean um, for the prospects of Israeli-Palestinian peace? And a related question, what type of peace do you think they might bring, right? So, um, uh, you know, how, how does this affect the Palestinians, for example? What, what how, do, how do these relationships that have been forged in recent years change things on the ground? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, uh, to speak in this panel. Um, and, uh, it's, it's always me that starts with the hard questions and the first one, but I'm, I'm fine with that. I got, I got used to it. Um, I, I would like just to say, to say something in terms of the changes we, we are experiencing in the Middle East. I think we are all experiencing so many changes in the world, uh, in addition to everything that is happening in the Middle East, uh, everything that's happened uh, with COVID and like the general just like changes in, in in, in the um, you know work in, in work and like in, in everything that is happening is actually giving me hope personally uh, because for the first time we are experiencing a change some kind of a change after having a very static uh, and and not stable I wouldn't use the word stable for the Middle East but like we didn't see much changes uh, for for many many years um, uh, no changes in the government or like in other in on other things and suddenly are experiencing all the changes at once. So for me personally, it gives me hope that changes are possible and therefore we are not going to stay forever in, in this current situation where uh, we don't have a solution here at home or where governments are not changing towards any kind of uh, uh, positive direction. Um, when it comes to the Abraham Accords, so I joined ROPES um, uh, in 2019, I met uh, Ben then and uh, decided to give the regional approach a chance uh, before um, I give the, the political word. I was very desperate at that time. I was really tired. And then uh, when I heard about this regional approach, I decided to give this a chance. But I never imagined uh, this reality that we are at today. Uh, definitely didn't imagine Abraham Accords happening. And I must say that it was very shocking for us at the beginning, like for everyone else. It's it's not necessarily something, um, I, I personally didn't see it as something positive at first. It was very shocking and, and as a Palestinian, or I think all Palestinians just felt like it is the end of the world in a way that now no one will, will care anymore about um, uh, the conflict, about the occupation, about the situation of Palestinians in general, and let alone equality and, and things that we are fighting for here um, in Israel. Um, and um, I think that we are also still experiencing these changes. We are still in the middle of this transaction uh, into this new era. Um, and um, everyone is very overwhelmed. Like I, I work with, with young, young leaders and governments um, in the region, and I think everyone is very confused and overwhelmed still. Uh, and no one is really understanding what, what, where is this change going? Change is going to, and everyone is trying to push towards their direction. And I think that we are in a very important uh, stage where we all need to really push for our direction for the right direction, I would put it this way, um, because, because it, it is now that things are moving in the region. Um, and more than this, I think it's very dangerous for us not to do anything and not use these uh, changes and, and everything that is happening in the region uh, to try to actually use the opportunity of creating a new reality. I do think that the fact that we have a change in, in, in politics here in Israel is also as a result uh, of all of, of everything that is happening and like uh, uh, we're hoping to see more changes coming in the coming year and other governments um, uh, here at home. I am optimistic and I'm really curious to hear what uh, my colleagues have to say here. I am optimistic and I think these changes really gave us the hope that we can we can do something and we can make a change in, in the region. And I, I will elaborate more about it later today. Maybe we can go to Naveen and then um, Ksenia and Shama. Sure. Um, um, good evening, everybody. It's evening time here. Good morning. <laughs> 
And uh, again, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a Palestinian who is living in East Jerusalem. And um, I, think, I think to answer your question, we should look at it at which level we are talking about. If we're talking about the level of the Arab governments, and we need to be specific which Arab governments we are talking about, those who were actually at war with Israel or those who were never at war with Israel. It's two different levels. And the other level that we should look at is the level of the people themselves, the grassroots level. Now, it's true that there is hope, as Bissan mentioned, that is, that is kind of emerging at the level of governments. But I still think that we need to do more reconciliation between young people and the people of the region in general, because there's so much uh, this feeling of injustice towards the Palestinians. And unless we solve this conflict, this feeling is not going to go away. Um, to give you an example, we have peace, Israel has peace agreements with Jordan and with Egypt. But talk to any Jordanian or any Egyptian, they want they will not accept to be friends with Israelis or like they will not really accept these peace accords because they say unless there is a, a solution, a just solution to the Palestinian Israeli conflict, we will not agree to those or we don't want to be part of those um, those peace uh, treaties. Now that said, there's um, I think. Uh, there is a big opportunity for those governments, Arab governments specifically, who signed an agreement with Israel to actually push for push Israel um, and the Palestinian Authority to go into negotiations. They can play the role of a broker uh, to bring both sides together. The question is, what are the interests that the um, that uh, you know? Um, that these Arab countries are going to have if they push for uh, for negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, and what is the role of the Palestinian Authority as well? I mean, um, would the Palestinian Authority be able to offer anything for the Arab countries and the Arab governments uh, as well? That said, if they don't push at all for any kind of, uh, of negotiations, I think we will see a continuation of the status quo as it is, but maybe an increase in economic uh, opportunities for the Palestinians. But at the same time, we will not see real reconciliation and real peace between the people in, in the region. So that's my 50 cents on that. Senia, we can hear some noise, but not not your voice yet. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, waiting for you to address me, actually. Yeah. Uh, so good morning and good evening to everyone. And thank you, Ben. Thank you, Professor Gruber, for organizing this panel. Um, so I would like to say that um, things are not static. Things change, uh, and we have to be in tune with everything that is happening in the world in the region, in our respective societies and countries. So first of all, I would have to mention that uh, the interesting development uh, took place in the uh, last few years. After decades, when Israelis were against any Arab intervention, uh, any uh, cooperation with the Arab countries in regards uh, to solving the uh, conflict with the Palestinians, suddenly in the last five, six, seven years, you hear more and more people in Israel who support the original approach, who do support that the Arab countries will be involved uh, in the possible uh, solution or the possible uh, reconciliation uh, with the Palestinians. So uh, what happened on the Palestinian side was just the opposite. For years, uh, the Palestinians were demanding the Arab countries to be more involved uh, in uh, the possible solution uh, of uh, the conflict. Uh, and uh, with signing of the uh, Abraham agreements, uh, we heard uh, quite a few voices in the Palestinian society uh, saying that uh, it's not welcome and uh, they uh, uh, do not think that it's a good thing to mix and match uh, between uh, the uh, peace agreements between Israel and the Arab world and between the resolution of the Palestinian conflict. Well, uh, it's of course important uh, that the focus uh, will not be switched uh, from the Israel and Palestinian arena. As some people thought naively, 
uh, in the beginning that uh, if you sign a peace agreement with Emirates uh, or with Bahrain or with some other Arab country, then you can just regard uh, the uh, very gruesome uh, reality uh, of the conflict with the Palestinians. But at the same time, I think that uh, as the world becomes uh, more uh, uh, differentiated, uh, as the world becomes uh, more complicated, uh, and not everything is anymore in black and white, uh, I think that uh, it's actually smart uh, for us to understand how we can combine with these two processes, reconciliation between Israel and Palestinians, the resolution of the conflict, and just solution, you know, for this uh, that is long awaited, uh, uh, you know, by uh, many people here, uh, and between the reconciliation between Israel and the Arab countries. Uh, so uh, my friend Nivin mentioned that there has to be economic uh, a reasoning uh, for involvement of the Arab countries and, uh, you know, uh, something that the Palestinian uh, autonomy can, be, can give them. Well, actually, this economic reasoning is here already, very simply. So uh, I heard from many Emirati friends during the war in Gaza this May that, uh, you know, uh, if it will aggravate, if the suffering of the Palestinian people will aggravate, actually, it will hurt the chances of promoting fast, uh, in a fast pace, uh, the uh, agreements, uh, the understandings, the MOUs uh, between Israeli and Emirati companies, think tanks, academy, and so on. So uh, if there is no resolution soon for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it means that also the uh, Abraham Accords may stall. It might not seem so today, but uh, if, uh, and believe me, you know, I'm visiting uh, on a weekly uh, basis uh, the Palestinian territories, Ramallah specifically, I'm talking to the people and, you know, I hear that people are on the brink of their ability. So if there will be an explosion in the West Bank, if something will happen again in Gaza Strip, of course, there will be consequences also for the Abrahamic Accords. So I think the connection between the two processes is inherent. Uh, and we have to, uh, the you know, uh, people in Palestinian autonomy, people in Israel, uh, globally also, you know, who understand how important it is to merge uh, between the two processes, uh, have to, you know, promote it with all of their might. This is exactly what ROPES is doing. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is uh, uh, very important. Uh, nobody else is doing it. Uh, and uh, kudos to Ben, uh, who uh, saw just, uh, you know, even before the Abraham Accords, uh, where the winds is blowing to. Uh, and I think that uh, this kind of work uh, is uh, essential, you know, for actually to make the opinion makers uh, who you know frame right now the policy to understand that you cannot do one without the other. Thank you, and Shama. Hello, can you hear me okay? Amazing. Thank you guys for having us. Thank you, Ropes, and thank you, Professor, for organizing to those people in the background, making sure this is flowing smoothly. Um, to echo what my friend Xenia just mentioned, um, forcing the Israeli side to de-escalate the situation in Palestine and with Palestinians um, has been one of the key uh, wins of the Abraham Accords insofar as the Palestinian cause uh, is concerned. Um, Israelis have sort of woken up to the fact that they can't just make peace in the region with new regional partners without um, uh, considering Palestinian human rights as part of the equation in order to maintain and further advance these peace agreements. Uh, now, like Bissan, and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm also cautiously optimistic um, about what will happen. Um, in the immediate short-term future, only because uh, I've been based in Dubai for, for five years. And so uh, what I've noticed from the uh, Israeli delegations, and we, we've had an influx in the UAE of Israelis who showed up over the last year. And what I've noticed um, in terms of political dynamics is that we're getting a lot of the sort of right-wing representation uh, who is more interested in advancing political and economic deals, but not so much in terms of shifting 
um, socio uh, socioeconomic dynamics and social mentalities in regards to uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So as long as the left is um, sort of disengaged um, within the framework of what's happening today with the Abrahamic Accords and the PCOs in the region, um, I remain a little bit, uh, as I mentioned, cautiously optimistic about, uh, about what happens going forward. Um, so there's a real need to effectively engage people from all political spectrums uh, within the new, uh, what we're calling the new Middle East, so the new uh, landscape um, that the Abraham Accords and the peace plans are sort of allowing. Now, in terms of uh, real progress, we are already seeing um, almost an existential crisis uh, unravel within Israelis, even actually specifically within uh, the right wing spectrum, because they're asking themselves for the first time, uh, do Arabs really hate us if they're willing to uh, make peace with us? Um, and they're finding a lot of warm uh, and welcoming uh, people on the other side and across the Gulf and uh, in North Africa. And so it's forcing this uh, internal debate um, and the reckoning with what they have sort of continuously seen as the biggest threat to peace in the region, which is this fundamental inherent anti-Semitism that the Muslim world is obsessed with. So that already is a big win. Um, it's also by, by engaging in this sort of existential debate, it forces also Israelis to reassess what an Arab is and what a Muslim is and what eventually what a Palestinian is. And if they are capable of having warm, uh, positive relations with Israelis. Um, in terms of other uh, wins for uh, all countries involved in the region, uh, we have a clear pattern of fighting radicalism that, that um, is only being solidified. And I can testify uh, to the UAE and to Morocco, because we have to understand the dynamics that allowed the Abrahamic Accords to really show up. The biggest reason, in my opinion, is the fact that the Arab Spring allowed the regimes of the Middle East and North Africa to wake up to the fact that uh, the most severe threat to, the, to these governments and regimes staying in power is um, Islamic radicalism. And we saw this across the region, whether in Egypt or Libya, Tunisia, Morocco. In Morocco, from which I'm talking to you today, I'm in Casablanca. So maybe that's what you saw, Professor. Um, in Morocco, we recently uh, just ushered in a new government. And for the first time in 10 years, it is not an Islamist government. Um, and in fact, we witnessed the biggest drop in Islamist representation in, in the history of any government. Um, they went from having over 140 seats to only 13 seats in parliament. Uh, this is major. It also speaks to the patterns and the dynamics that we've been uh, witnessing across the region to um, de-radicalize countries from within. Um, and so it is a very strategic goal and that inevitably has repercussions for within uh, Israeli society and politics because uh, we're also witnessing some reverberations within uh, Israeli rhetoric to fight radicalism and extremism within uh, even Jewish spaces. Um, and it's really forcing a lot of difficult conversations within and I'm not I'm sure you've seen that uh, Minister of Interior, Ayala Chiquet, who was just in the UAE and announced her interest in promoting tolerance and interfaith dialogue within Israel and copying the UAE model for tolerance uh, within. So these are, I, I celebrate as, of course, progress. Uh, and I think that uh, it's, it's really kind of pushing the region 
um, in the right direction. Thank you. These are these have been wonderfully uh, thoughtful responses. Um, in the interest of time, I'm since since we we have kind of this short time, I'm going to ask kind of a series of short questions and ask and ask you to just kind of give us a, a minute response each. Um, you know, I wish this were a two hour or a three hour panel, right, over some good falafel and hummus, but um, that is not in the works at present. So um, the first questions I'm, I'm going to, put, to pose to Naveen and Ksenia, um, particularly about the two state solution. So beginning in 14, in 14, in 1947, right, the two state solution has been the framework um, for the resolution of this conflict. However, it seems like among younger, younger generations on both sides, there has been a shift away from that framework um, and instead uh, more towards a variety of different solutions, one state and other interesting types of solutions. I wanna, I wanna hear from you, do you see that shift happening? And if so, what are those solutions and what do you think about them? That's a lot for a, for a minute response, or, but um, yeah, and others can jump in as well. Um, so let's start with Naveen. <laughs> I wanted actually to hit Zanya first, but I can go. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Actually, just a little bit of statistics before we, well, before my one minute is um, if you look at it at the Palestinian side, and these are the statistics in September, actually, they show that there is a drop in the two state solution to about 36 percent only believe or support a two-state solution. 73% um, believe that there's not going to be a Palestinian state next to an Israeli state within the next five years. And 27% um, uh, are in favor of abandoning the two-state solution, while 56% support the uh, confidence building building measures between Israelis and Palestinian government. So it's it's kind of very devastating uh, statistics if you if you say if if you actually a big supporter for the two state solution, and this is where it brings us to okay. So what is the alternative? And I think for the from the Palestinian perspective, the alternative is not clear yet. It's true that Palestinians may say a one state solution, but they don't really understand what it means. What are the pillars of that one state solution? Is it based on uh, an Israeli Palestinian government or living under an Israeli government? Is it about having equal, uh, you know, equality, equal citizens, uh, one man, one, vo one, one vote kind of, um, kind of notion or not? But um, if we look at the why, these statistics are happening. It's actually because if we look at the realities on the ground, realities are quite devastating. First of all, the internal Palestinian uh, issue between the division of Hamas uh, the, uh, in Gaza and, and uh, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Um, and this divide has been ongoing for so many years. It doesn't seem to be uh, ending anytime soon. Uh, the Palestinians themselves don't feel able to politically participate in any process or have their voices heard either. Um, there's also a control by the Israeli state over the lives of the Palestinians in a sense of, uh, you know, how, how you travel, where you live, uh, even economy, in what kind of job opportunity you have is controlled by the Israeli government. And most importantly, if you look at the settlements, the settlements over the last couple of years have increased enormously. And with, with this growth of settlements, it is almost impossible to imagine a Palestinian state that has geographical continuity, as well as the actual physical separation between Gaza and the West Bank itself. Um, um, also, if you look at economic ties, I mean, the number of Palestinians who work in Israel on a daily basis is hundreds of thousands of young Palestinian men and women <coughs> who cross every day to work in Israel or they work in Israeli settlements. If you look at the borders, if you look at, uh, you know, marketing, if you look at even even Internet is controlled by Israel itself. All these different factors doesn't give a Palestinian the notion that there actually a two-state solution is still possible. 
and I'll stop there. And uh, I will continue if uh, you allow. Um, well, first of all, I have to mention that uh, although sometimes it seems that it's a lost cause, but still, if we are looking objectively on the maps uh, and uh, Shaul Ariely from the Geneva Initiatives does wonderful tours to show that the two-state solution is still possible. Uh, yes, it is difficult, uh, but uh, as you know, in the Middle East, we do not choose between simple and simpler solution. We choose between uh, impossible and uh, very difficult, you know, in the best case. So it is still possible, and the supporters of the two-state solution are still the largest groups in their respective societies, in Israel and in Palestinian autonomy. Because uh, as uh, Nivin just mentioned, there is no clear understanding uh, what can be the alternative. Uh, confederation, one state, apartheid state, uh, well, you know, all of these opportunities, all of these possibilities, you know, uh, seems unrealistic. Uh, for me, I explore the uh, situation in this region for now almost 20 years. And I can tell you, frankly, if I'm looking to the future, uh, it is a frightening future if there is no two-state solution in it. Uh, because uh, for me, as an Israeli, it's clearly uh, that, uh, you know, in the beginning, we have the perspective uh, of uh, the very ugly uh, word that starts with an A, I pronounced it already, apartheid. Uh, and uh, well, you know, this is not something that uh, any of us who supports democratic uh, society, just society, uh, would want to live in and to raise their children in. Uh, so uh, this is first. Uh, this is second, actually. Uh, the third thing is about the young generation. Well, you know, interesting things happen to young people. They grow older. And uh, sometimes this youth vigor, uh, well, it's replaced for a more realistic kind of view. And we see it with the respective leaderships, actually on both sides. Uh, we see what happened to people like Tsipi Livni, for example, who started her way in Likud, as you know. Uh, and now she's considered to be a lefty, you know, a center left, uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, we look at, for example, Jibril Rajub uh, and the other people of his age. So 30 years ago, 35 years ago, you know, they used to be the revolutionaries. They used to be those uh, who were arrested uh, by uh, uh, Israeli police and the Israeli uh, military and so on. Uh, so again, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, because, you know, I'm optimistic. I live in the Middle East. I have to be an optimist. Uh, I still believe that, you know, with uh, wise leadership, with determination, uh, and if you do start to change reality on the ground, you will have the surge in support for two-state solution once again, just like it happened 20, 25 years ago. Uh, so it again, it's in our hands. It's not in anybody else's hands. But if we will lose this opportunity then, yes, uh, we will meet in five years or 10 years and say, wow, we had a chance and we lost it. Thank you. I know Bisan would also like to comment here. Yes, thank you. I'll be short, I promise. I just want to make another comment from my perspective as a Palestinian citizen of Israel regarding the this two-state two, two solution, one-state solution. And I would, just, I would just say that we started the discussion by saying that there is a new generation in the Middle East, which, which is very true. There is a new generation. And this new, new generation is just tired of compromising, I would say. Uh, uh, if I, I grew up in a very political activist house, we, uh, we, are, we were all activists for like coexistence and, and the new generation is tired of this word coexistence and we want equality, we want shared society, like even the language has changed and there is a new language right now. And um, I always felt frustrated by this two state solution since it, I knew that it's not going to so solve my problems in any way. When we talk about two state solution, we don't necessarily talk about the internal issues in Israel and like we we deal with it with the solution as everything is perfect in the country uh, and meanwhile there are lots of um, uh, right wing and extreme laws that are being passed uh, uh, such as the Nakba law such as the nation sta state bill uh, law and um, um, we are just and we saw that during the last word that the young generation is just tired of compromising we don't want to compromise anymore we want an actual, we want to feel equal in, in our home and we don't feel that. And um, this is creating a lot of frustration also when we, in the discourse itself. And I agree with Niven that I don't think 
uh, Palestinians really understand what does it mean, is this one state solution? Um, I personally am very afraid of this. I, I imagine it as like just being a whole one big Israel, which, which is not uh, necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean shared society or equality, but like very far from it. So there is, in my opinion, um, a, a need to elaborate more on these solutions and actually talk about them and what and what do they mean and maybe propose a new creative uh, um, solution to the discourse. I'll stop, I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, I imagine Shama has something to say on this as well. Shama, I'm also going to give you an, an, an additional question, right, which is uh, Sounds good. Which, given your background, I think you you would have you know something interesting to say on right, which is the, the religious history between Jews and and Muslims. Um, is that a, how is that a barrier to peace at present? Are there ways in which it could be a building block? So, if you could, a couple of minutes to chat on that as well. Yeah. So to answer the first question, and I'll connect it. Um, First of all, I identify as both Muslim and Jewish. Um, I come from a mixed family, which uh, <laughs> interestingly, you kind of grew up in the middle of the conflict, even though I grew up in Morocco and Casablanca until I was 17. Um, and I have to say that I, I do feel that it is not my, uh, it is not within my rights to comment on whether the two state solution or the one state solution is the best way forward because I believe in people's agencies and I'm an existentialist. So I feel I would be stripping away from someone's freedom, especially marginalized minorities by doing so. Uh, but I have to say that to, to echo what uh, our friend Xenia mentioned, it would be extremely difficult to envision a one state solution specifically because the two communities are extremely traumatized. And this is not a result of uh, deep um, historical division of Judaism and Islam throughout time, but it's more a result of the political situation over the last 73 uh, plus years. And because of the ideologies that have uh, governed the region and the severe impact of colonialism in the region. Uh, we have to understand that uh, to, to, to sort of start answering your question on uh, the history between the two religions, colonialism in the region was what sort of created uh, a systematic divide between Judaism and Islam. Before that, Judaism and Islam were enmeshed together. Uh, Islam is definitely uh, inspired by Judaism as the third Abrahamic religion and, uh, and Judaism was shaped by Islam because of the influence of Muslim culture and because of Andalusia and because of the fusion of Muslim Jewish cultures that gave rise to strong Muslim empires in the region and Jews were uh, active members of Muslim societies and they were very involved uh, within certain political uh, dynasties in the region. They were put in royal courts as advisors, as ambassadors, um, and were a big, uh, big part of the sort of the, the, the commerce of the region, the merchants of the region. So they had a massive impact, not just politically, but also socially and culturally and spiritually on one another. Now, colonialism, when it stepped into the region. It uh, inevitably created lots of division between the two communities. One big example and scar an example of that is the Cremio Decree, which was pronounced in 1870 in Algeria by a French general who granted citizenship, French citizenship to the Jewish communities of Algeria and some parts of North Africa. And so the majority of the Jews of Algeria became naturalized French citizens. And meanwhile, the Muslims who were actively, of course, fighting the occupation of their land were saw that as a betrayal, right, uh, of, of the cause of their liberation and their human rights. And so that was a, a big first instance 
uh, that broke the relationship between the two. Um, now, unfortunately, because of Arab nationalism and de Islamization of the Arab Palestinian, the Palestinian Israeli conflict, the Arabization of, of the conflict also, there are so many ideologies that made the conflict actually a conflict between East and West, between democracy and autocracy, between uh, Islam and Judaism, between uh, uh, liberalism and sort of the dark ages. This is not helpful and it does not really reflect the history of both religions in this region. Uh, also, even, even uh, calling it, uh, in my opinion, an Arab-Israeli conflict or just using uh, Arab identity within the framework of the context of the conflict is actually really, really difficult because uh, Arab identity is uh, a construct effectively because we have so many minorities that are not accounted for in what we call the Arab world. And these minorities are complex and complicated and don't necessarily, even if they identify, let's say, as Muslim, there are so many branches within Islam and you know, many uh, the different communities within the same branch can identify as liberal or as atheist, but culturally Muslim. And unfortunately, when we talk about the region, especially in the West, we fail to recognize these complexities. And that only adds to the problem. Um, we have Jewish communities, uh, Mizrahim within Israel, who, uh, who relate to Arab culture. Many of them speak uh, Arabic uh, dialects or even classical Arabic in some, in some cases, but we, they're not seen as, uh, as Arab even. They're not accounted for when we talk about the conflict. So all of these, uh, this essentialism that happened around the conflicts and in the region and the Orientalism that has deeply affected the region and the segregation between Muslim Islam and Judaism and the emptying of Jewish communities and Christian minorities from the region uh, inevitably led to uh, this sort of massive conflict that we are struggling to find solutions for today. Um, but we have, to, we have to contextualize everything. We have to revive, I believe, and this is one of my missions, is to really revive the pluralism, the historical pluralism of this region. Uh, and to, sorry, I can hear something else. Can you guys hear me okay? Just a thumbs up, okay, perfect. So we, we really, we have to take it upon ourselves to complicate the picture, introduce as much nuance as possible in our rhetoric about the Middle East and North Africa, in our rhetoric about who's Jewish and who's Muslim and about the conflict and to make sure to really tell the story in all of its complexity about Islam, about Judaism in the region, about Christianity and to, try as much as we can to de-escalate the traumas of, of, these, of these communities and to go back to saying the stories that we find within our history that are very empowering in terms of building a pluralistic future. Of course, our generation today won't see a one state solution as a viable option, because they haven't lived with pluralism. You know, my generation, the reason why I do this work uh, specifically in Muslim Jewish interfaith dialogue, and I've been doing it for almost 15 years, is because my generation in Morocco and in other places in the region grew up completely removed from the stories of pluralism that our fathers, our grandfathers, our grandmothers and mothers lived in, right? They lived in this very deeply complex society in which the Jew, or the Muslim or the Christian was the neighbor, depending on the context. So we haven't had this experience and we are completely empowered by the fights, as Bissan mentioned, for equality and social justice. And we are empowered by technology to pursue what is just and what is democratic in a region that has not really uh, succeeded in implementing democracy and has had a very different history, even in its political history, has had moments that were really beautiful and pluralistic and inclusive, but didn't look like Western democracies. 
So we have to be careful uh, when we when we import those concepts and values and principles as well. I hope I answered your questions, but of course, if you have any other- Thank you. Know. This this is just, boy, we have, we have more questions and were I more, more dictatorial, right, moderator, I might have cut you off, but these were just such thoughtful responses. So what we're going to do is, is uh, we have a question on, on the chat here for ropes. We're going to turn some time to Ben, um, and, uh, and then he'll As long as you're running a benevolent dictatorship professor, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> all dictators think they're benevolent in some ways. I guess maybe not all. So. <laughs> We'll, okay, Bed, we'll, we'll give you a moment here for the ropes question and, and then to conclude us. I unfortunately need to slip out in, in like three minutes, but um, I just want to say thank you for everyone. This has been fantastic. Okay, Ben. Okay, so Ben, the question is how does ropes view organizations such as boycott divestment sanctions? Um, do you think placing economic pressure is an effective solution in forcing peace? So go ahead and take that away, Ben. I said, oh my God, you give me the easy one. Um, so anyway, I, I wanna make a few points about BDS. And um, unfortunately, this is an issue on which we don't have a very nuanced discourse. So I wanna preface what I'm going to say with two major points. Um, number one, I wanna say that I definitely understand um, especially from Palestinians, the impetus behind BDS. And I especially want to say that, you know, I understand why a young Palestinian who is under occupation who feels like the Israeli government, at least of, over the past decade or so, hasn't really shown an interest in creating a Palestinian state, and yet who doesn't want to engage in violent um, tactics. Um, I, I can understand why they would see BDS as really the only effective means they have to fight the occupation and fight for a Palestinian state. So I, I definitely get that. I also think we need to differentiate between two types of BDS because they tend to be lumped together, frankly, by people who I think are arguing in bad faith. There is the BDS that is directed at Israel as a whole. So basically that is uh, trying to boycott Israel in the way that let's say South Africa was boycotted. So, um, you know, no concerts going, um, people putting economic sanctions, whatever and the sort of BDS that's targeted at Israeli economic activities over the green line in the settlements. A, a very recent example of this was Ben and Jerry's um, decided they were gonna stop selling their ice cream beyond the green line in, in West Bank settlements. And you, know, you would have thought that there was a new Holocaust given the, the response that this provoked on our side. But I wanna say that I have no issue personally and Ropes has no issue personally with the latter type of, of BDS. In fact, I personally you know, just boycott settlement products. I don't really feel good about supporting them. Um, but I am very much against BDS, and we are against BDS directed at Israel as a whole for a couple of reasons. Number one, I personally don't think it is fair. Um, fair in the sense that it is boycotting not just those Israelis who support continued occupation, but people like Bissan, you know, the 20% of Israelis who are Palestinian citizens of Israel, and also the very many Israelis like Ksenia who have been fighting for peace passionately. Um, and I also think it's not fair to engage in any activity that places all the blame for where we are on one side or the other. So for those two reasons, I'm personally against it. And clearly, we at Ropes don't support it. But the really more important reason why um, I don't support BDS is I just don't think it's effective at bringing us closer to a solution to this issue. And I understand people want to make the argument, well, this worked in South Africa, but I think you always have to understand that there are different contexts. And I would say that when it comes to Israel, you have to understand that there's a very particular um, psychological, Dr. Gubler, <laughs> uh, context here, which is the Jewish psyche of persecution over the centuries. And so the same sort of um, uh, activities that seek to isolate uh, a country might have a different effect in a country like Israel, where suddenly that's put in the tradition of anti-Semitism, which I certainly don't view BDS as being inherently anti-Semitic. And lastly, um, I think to be effective, I don't rule out the fact that a BDS strategy could be effective, but the amount of pressure you would have to harness to really get Israel to change its behavior is so much greater than what has been able to be achieved by the BDS movement. Really the only thing the BDS movement has achieved politically is that they have strengthened the right wing in Israel. 
And frankly, they've given <laughs> a cause, a raison d'etat for many Israeli organizations and Jewish organizations that style themselves as fighting the BDS boogeyman. Um, and really, um, you know, it really hasn't helped those of us who have been fighting both in the American Jewish community and in Israel because people want to just use BDS as a distraction. So for those reasons, we think there is a, a much more effective strategy, and that's a strategy of engagement uh, and trying to build bridges, um, but build bridges not just for the sake of building bridges, but building bridges specifically for the cause of bringing about a two-state solution. So, um, you know, I might look at this differently if I felt like that uh, route uh, was not possible, but I think we can see through the activity of ropes and the activity of many great organizations that there really is a lot of hope for people-to-people -people efforts. And I think one of the greatest um, developments in this regard is that there is a, now a $250 million fund that has, be, that has been passed by the US Congress to support activities like ropes and other peace building organizations over the coming years. Um, so with that, I just wanna thank Dr. Gubler, thank uh, Tristan Quist again, thank Esther, thank the entire BYU team for having us, thank our amazing panelists. Uh, I, I'm really just privileged to be surrounded by Bisan and Naveen on a daily basis and also people like Senya and Shama. And just want to say that we really, um, we want to stay in touch with you if you want to stay in touch with us, and we would love to invite you to future events that we hold from time to time. So, uh, like I said, if you were interested in getting involved with us, um, feel free to post your email address and we will reach out to you and make sure that you get our updates. And if you are somebody who um, has means and wants to support activities like ours and make a pledge, a tax deductible donation to Ropes' work, um, I've included a link uh, in the chat box, but you can also go directly to ropes.org slash give where there are instructions um, for you to do that. So with that, I really hope we see you soon. And I um, just want to leave you all with some hope. I really do believe that this would be the decade when we finally resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as difficult as that is to imagine, it is going to happen. And it's going to happen primarily because of the uh, great people that you've heard today and many more like that. So thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to staying in touch with you.